Now let's talk a little bit about the various digestive tracts that we're going to deal with with the total feeds family. We have a feed for ruminant animals. We have the total bull, total goat, and total lamb, total deer. And they're all ruminant animals. And in this diagram, it shows how that the, the ruminant digestive tract is composed of a large, very large rumen. And whenever an animal eats any kind of material, it, it's ground up by the teeth, it goes into the rumen, and lays there, but they don't have to chew it very well because they can swallow large particles of grass, large particles of hay. And that allows them the opportunity then to let that lay in there and be digested by a fermentation process by bacteria. In this process, we also have a process that allows them to reprocess. And I'm sure most of you have watched ruminant animals laying around, uh, uh, look like they're just lounging and all of a sudden they, they belch, kind of. And what they do is they cough up what they, is called a bolus, which is a mass of, of that partially processed material that they can bring back up in their mouth. They chew it again, it's already been wetted and it's already been partially digested, so they process it again and get it into finer material and they can keep doing this till, till they get that worn down and it ferments. That's the advantage the ruminant has in nature eating fiber. They're fiber users. And then if you go from the rumen to the reticulum, which is the next small stomach on, on the uh, ruminant animal, that's where uh, it, it pushes moisture back that, that gets out of the rumen, because the rumen is a very wet place, there's a lot of moisture. And what gets into the, it, it compresses and pushes that moisture back into the rumen to conserve that moisture. And then it goes through a series of the reticulum and then the abomasum, which is the same stomach that you and I have, the same stomach that uh, a simple stomach has, uh, like a horse. Uh, they have the abomasum or true stomach that that feed goes into next. Then they go into the intestinal tract. So it's a fairly complex digestive system, but it's very efficient in nature because it allows them to use a very high fiber material. When we start feeding them a starchy material, that's when we start having problems with them. But now let's contrast that to the horse. That I always tell people that the horse, nature has given the horse a backward digestive tract. The horse is a fiber digester. They've existed on fiber for however long a horse has been on the planet, and I don't even know how long they've been here. But they've been a fiber digester. The problem a horse has always had is that the, the feed goes into the true stomach and it has to be whatever digestion takes place in the true stomach and then the intestinal tract, then it goes into the fermentation later. They do not have the opportunity to reprocess it at all. That's why a horse processes their hay or grass much more carefully than a ruminant animal does because they have to have it in very small particles in order to get very much out of it uh, in the small, uh, in the true stomach and in the intest small intestine. But the advantage we have in a horse is that we can manipulate some of the things going on because right behind the true stomach they have 70 feet of small intestine. And that's an awful long uh, tube to work with. And so we have that luxury of being able to be able to digest and absorb if whatever we can get digested during that period of time before it gets to the fermentation part of the stomach. That's why the extrusion process makes it so efficient to do that in a horse because if it dissolves in and um, if you will put some of the kibbles of total equine or any of the other products in water, they dissolve in three minutes. Three minutes gives that, that 70 feet of intestine several hours then to absorb the very expensive nutrients we put in feeds. And uh, the ones that we, that we want absorbed in that area are the trace minerals and vitamins and, and these kinds of nutrients that we don't want to get into the hind gut because the absorption capacity or ability of that small intestine is far superior to the hind gut, the cecum or the colon. We'll get into a little more of that later. 
Then we have the avian digestive tract, which is a little different again. Uh, they have a, a uniqueness about them, uh, and nature has provided them a way that they can eat some fairly fibery material. They can eat whole grains and do a much better job than can a horse or a cow or a goat or anybody else. But the avian or the, any of the birds, they can process these because they have, uh, first of all, they have a holding area uh, in, in, in a kind of a pouch called the crop in the front part right below the neck. That, that's where the feed goes in and stays there for a while. That's a holding area until there's room down below. And while it's there, it's already starting to ferment because avians do have a lot of bacteria. They have a lot of bacterial action. Then as it moves down into the crop, I mean into the gizzard area, the gizzard is what does the real work in an avian. In nature, they eat a lot of whole seeds, don't they? I mean, out in the wild, like uh, quail, pheasants, and, and birds like that, uh, and chickens that are in the backyard and they're throwing out whole grains, uh, like uh, a, scr a chicken scratch, <laughs> you know, that, that's whole grain usually. Well, they have to have a way to break up that hull and grind that into smaller particles. And that's where the gizzard comes in. The gizzard, as if you dress chickens or if you like to eat gizzards, you know how strong and tough that muscle is. It's one of the toughest muscles you'll ever run into. And the reason is that there's an opening in there and that can sit there and, and, and grind. It literally compresses and grinds if they have grit. And that, that's one of the, the, the things that a chicken has to have. In the wild, they can pick up a lot of little stones, little gravelly type stuff, and, and they do eat that. And, that. and the reason they do that is so that there's some graining action and they, they can break all that grain open. When we bring in chickens into the domestic world, they no longer have to eat grit. Why is that? Because we grind it for them. Like with Total Bird, we grind it for them so that they don't have to grind it themselves, and we've saved them that step, and they can just go ahead and eat it, and it's, it's soluble so it goes on through the system, and that gizzard does very little work other than pass the, pass the food along. And then it goes right into an intestine, and they really don't have a small and large intestine like other animals, uh, like animals do. Uh, they just have one kind of intestinal tract that very good absorbability, and so that's the differences in the three types of digestive tracts that you deal with uh, on the, uh, the, with our products. Now, why are these different sites important? And I've already touched on a lot of that, but we like to think about enzymatic or chemical digestion versus uh, microbial digestion. That's the two main kinds of digestion we have. Enzymatic is simply enzymes like lipase and protease and amylase that, that digest the, the fat, the uh, protein, or the starchy part of the diet. Uh, then we had fibrolytic bacteria, or uh, enzymes that will do a lot of damage to some of the more simple fibers, but only the simple fibers. So in, in the, um, the, uh, the horse, we can get some of that done to the fiber in the small intestine and the stomach uh, at, before it gets to the hind gut. But then we still have to, to rely on that microbial activity in the cecum and colon. And that is a very positive thing. Uh, it's something we, we always will try to work with, but it also can be causative to several problems that horses have, like colic and founder. Why do we colic or founder horses? What is man-made colic or founder? That is simply the, the introduction of too much raw or partially processed starch into the hind gut or the cecum at any given time. They can handle some. They can handle it on a continuous basis as long as it's consistent and, and not variable in quantity. But it's because the fermentation of starch is so much faster than that of fiber that when, when that uh, starch hits the hind gut, it ferments very quickly and we form gas, uh, methane, carbon dioxide, uh, lactic acid, and then the volatile fatty acids, acetic, propionic, and butyric, and valeric, and those which are good guys because they're the energy source and we're not gonna get into the end products of, of uh, microbial digestion in the rumen or the hindgut because that's not really necessary here. 
But we don't want excess of lactic acid. We don't want excess of carbon dioxide and methane, which are end products of that process. If we get too much, we can colic or, like, say, founder a horse. That's where our products come into play on a safety factor. If you have all of the starch dis disappear in the small intestine, never gets into the hindgut, you've now reduced or eliminated the, the possibility of colic or founder in a horse. And that's really what we hear out on the firing line, and that is people will call me quite often and say, my horse got into the feed room last night and ate a half a bag of feed. What should I do? I say, nothing. There's always a quiet pause on the other end of the phone, and they say, really? I say, yes. Uh, just, uh, you don't have to worry about it. Just feed them when they get hungry again, when feeding time comes. And I've never had anybody call back in eight years, and I get one of these calls probably at least every other one month, sometimes once a month. Um, so I know that if you extrude this feed and change that starch to that way, you're not going to have the danger of colic or founder. That's, that's a very key thing in, in our program that, that we're very proud of, and that's what you can tell your customers, uh, that, that they don't have to worry about that. And not that they're going to purposely let their horse eat too much, but it happens, because horses are horses, and feed rooms all have locks that can be picked um, by horses. Uh, so, so that, and that's the difference between chemical and microbial. Uh, we depend on the, the chemical as much as we can uh, in the small intestine, but then, like in the ruminant animal, uh, in these other ruminant animals, not only does the extrusion process help the digestibility and solubility in those situations, but for some reason, and I, I'm not sure that I can fully explain why this is happening, but we've had cases where uh, it happened in bucking bulls early on when we started working with bucking bulls. When they travel, they tend to bloat once in a while, and have digestive problems with what they're feeding. Had cases where bulls were, were bloating on the road and somebody would give them some total bull and say, here, just put them on total bull for a couple of days and, and the problem would disappear. You're not gonna bloat uh, an, an animal, whether it's, uh, well, you're not going to bloat deer because they're too careful, but you can bloat lam uh, lambs, you can bloat goats, you can bloat, bloat uh, you know, bovine quite easily if you feed erratically and give them a little too much starch. You can take a bovine and put them on all the total bull they would want to eat today, and they, they don't bloat. Two reasons, and we'll get into some of that later, one reason is uh, the starch availability is, uh, is so available uh, that the bacteria can convert it to energy very quickly without going through some of the uh, steps that they normally have to go through. The second thing is the presence of uh, a compound or a, an ingredient that we're going to talk about, Ascophyllum nodosum, which helps control or change the microbial population in a rumen, cecum, whatever, wherever it is, it helps change the microbial population. 